grace, mercy, and peace, they are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this morning is based on the reading from Genesis chapters 12 and 22. Isaac was the promised son. God told 75-year-old Abraham to pack up his things, move to a land he had never been to, a land that would be promised to his offspring. At this point, Abraham and his wife had no children. What offspring were they going to have? 75 years old, Abraham was. 65 was his wife. But God promised, I will make you a great nation. For 25 more years, Abraham and Sarah waited. That's a long time to wait. It was hard for them to see how God would keep his promise. They even tried to force their own timetable on God's promise. Abraham had a child with Sarah's slave, Hagar. But her son, Ishmael, was not the promised son. Finally, when Abraham was 100 years old, he, his promised son was born, Isaac. He was the natural child of Abraham and Sarah. Well, as natural as it could have been, Sarah couldn't have children, but by a miracle, God allowed her to bear Isaac. God had given a further promise to Abraham. He told him, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, this promise could mean a lot of things. It could mean that the offspring that Abraham would have would grow into a great nation, a protector nation that would defend all the little nations out there. It could mean that they would become a technological nation with all kinds of advances, benefiting society. It could mean that they were a nation of law and order where people could come and live and find safety. But we hear that this was the promise of salvation. In the book of Acts, after Peter and John heal the man who could not walk, they stand up and give a sermon to the crowd that is gathered. And in this sermon they say, He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, that's Jesus, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. That promise, long before made to Abraham, it was about Jesus. Through Abraham's offspring, offspring, all nations on earth would be blessed. Perhaps not so much his many, many offspring, but one offspring in particular, Jesus. Just as God promised Adam and Eve in the garden that he would send the one who would crush the serpent's head, God makes this promise to Abraham who would come that he would have an offspring who would come to bless all the peoples of the worth, world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But this was long before Jesus. Did Abraham understand this? He did. We heard in the book of Hebrews, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, if you read the whole account of Abraham, you'll see that he never lived in a city. He always lived in tents while he was here on earth. Even though he's a very rich man, he lived in tents his whole life. But the book of Hebrews continues. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham had the hope of a heaven, 
the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God, because of the offspring who would come through his son, Isaac. So what happened later is all the more shocking. God tested Abraham. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. This was the promised son, the son Abraham waited a hundred years for. How could God do this? How could he go back on his promise? More than that, how would he keep his promise of making Abraham a great nation? I suppose there was the other son, Ishmael, but he wasn't the promised son. Would God make him into a great nation like he'd promised? Even more than that, what about the promise of salvation? All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. How would a savior come from Abraham's offspring through Isaac's offspring if Isaac were dead? What was God doing? How could God allow himself to do this? But Abraham doesn't say a word. He packs up the next morning. He takes two of his servants and his son Isaac. They say goodbye to the boy's mother. Does she know? Did he tell her? What was going through Abraham's mind at this moment? How could he still listen to a God who made such an egregious demand? We heard in the second reading today in Hebrews. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did, he did receive Isaac back from death. The circumstances didn't seem to match the promise. Abraham certainly couldn't see how God was going to keep his promise, but by faith he knew that God would keep his promise. They climb the mountain, father and son. Isaac speaks up. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? We've got the wood, we've got the fire, we've got the knife, we've got everything except one thing. We don't have the sacrificial lamb. In faith, Abraham replies, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham builds an altar of stones he places the wood on top of the altar. He sets it alight. Everything is ready. Well, he doesn't set it alight because Isaac goes on top and doesn't, doesn't die. But the wood is there. He binds Isaac by the hands. And he picks up his son, who at this point is probably 9, 10, 11. And he places him on the altar. And then he takes out the knife. He's ready to slay his son. His only son. Isaac. Just then the angel of the Lord calls out, Abraham, Abraham! Do not do anything to this boy. Do not lay a hand on him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld me withheld from me your son your only son god kept his promise even though abraham didn't see or know how he would god stayed faithful to his promise and abraham's faith in god was proven right his faith was proven right in another way too abraham had said to isaac God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. 
And as the angel of the Lord spoke to Abraham, he lifted his eyes, and there he saw a ram caught by its horns, a substitute for Isaac. The substitute reminds us of another substitute. The one promised that we heard last week who would crush the serpent's head. We heard about that son promised to Eve. At Christmas we celebrate the son born to Mary. Oh, wondrous love, what have you done? The father offers up his son. Even Jesus reminds us that God keeps his promise when we can't see how. If you heard the promise that one was coming to crush the serpent's head who would come to bless all peoples on earth, how would you imagine it? Perhaps you would imagine a king riding in glory, coming to defeat all enemies. You would picture a rich man coming with the wealth of all nations to distribute it among all peoples. You would imagine a mighty earthly ruler who sits on a throne and brings justice to everyone. But the Father sends his Son. God sends Jesus. The Son of God takes on not the form of a king, but the form of a servant. Is that what you imagined? He lives his life in poverty. Is that how you thought it would be? His enemies rise up against him. They arrest him. They cause him to suffer. They kill him. Is that how you thought it would go? But even when we can't see how, God keeps his promise. The Son of God did not come to rule in an earthly way. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. His life is not taken from him. He substitutes his perfect life for our sinful lives gives himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. The promise is kept. Death is swallowed up in victory. By faith, we know that God keeps his promises to us. But we still struggle with the fact that we can't always see how. If you look back over the record of your life and you compare it with what God's word says, you might say, Well, sometimes my actions line up with what God's word says I should do, but my words less so, and my thoughts forget about it. In fact, the longer you're a Christian, the more deeply the law should cut you, should strike your heart as the Holy Spirit deepens your understanding of what God says in his law. You learn much more how subtly and often you offend your God. And that can lead you to think, when perhaps you didn't before as much, how can God possibly still keep his promise? My sin is too big. My sins are too many. The beauty is that God does keep his promises, even when we can't can't see how he could. As the Holy Spirit deepens our understanding of what God says in his law, he also deepens our understanding of God's love. God is almighty. There is no sin he can't forgive if he wants to. God is all loving. He wants to forgive every sin. God sent his son Jesus who gave the all-encompassing sacrifice that covers every sin. God's perfect justice is upheld. Therefore, God's promise to forgive all your sins, the big ones, small ones, the ones in between, that promise is kept. In the account of Abraham, we see God test Abraham. He allows a test of Abraham's faith. And God allows tests of our faith too. So it's not just our sin that causes us to doubt whether God will keep his promise. It's also the circumstances of our life, the trials, the tests. 
how can God possibly still keep his promise? I could give a whole list of ways that God allows tests of our faith. But you know better than I do right now what you're struggling with. After all, God's core promise of salvation brings all kinds of other promises with it. A right relationship with our Father while we're here on earth. The ability to pray to our God and he promises to hear us. The guarantee that God will bring you safely out of this world into the next. But those tests, they make us wonder. Make us doubt. If God isn't coming through for me here on earth, how can I know that he'll come through for me in heaven? Yet we see again and again here in the Bible, including in this account of Abraham, that God does keep his promise, even when we can't see how. The circumstances of our lives can't change God's faithfulness. Our own unfaithfulness won't change God's faithfulness. God will keep his promise. It might not be the way we want him to or the way we like. It might not even be the way we thought of or what we think is best. But God will keep his promise. He's already proven himself faithful a thousand times over. He will keep his promise to save you because he is the one who made the promise. Sometimes we can misunderstand that word testing. That word test takes us immediately to the classroom and we think of our teachers. Maybe you still have to take tests. Now your teacher doesn't give you a test just because that's part of their job or because they're mean. They give it because they want to see where you're at with your learning. And it gives you an opportunity to see where you're at with your learning too. But God already knows what's in your heart. We hear in the book of Proverbs, death and destruction lie open before the Lord. How much more then do human hearts? He doesn't have to evaluate your faith to know how strong or weak it is. He knows. So why does God allow testing? There are two main reasons. The first is to refine us. Peter says in his first letter, In all this you greatly rejoice, though for now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. God allows testing to remove what is still false in us. False faith in anyone or anything other than him. Those people are things that offer really empty promises. Purification from those favorite sins that we still like to hold on to and make excuses for. Refinement from the mind that easily gets distracted by the world around us. He uses testing to draw us closer to him who faithfully keeps his promises. The second reason, as we heard from Peter, is to prove the genuineness of our faith. God already knows whether your faith is genuine or not. He can see all things. He knows all things. But he wants you to see that it is genuine, that it does withstand testing and refinement. When you pass through the fire of testing and that faith in Jesus remains, even blossoms, he shows you the wonderful gift that he has given you by his Holy Spirit. Faith in your Savior Jesus, the fulfillment of his promise. No, you don't always get to see how God keeps his promise. You might even really be struggling with that right now. When you can't see how he will keep his promise, look back to how he has kept his promise. Go back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, also known as Israel. God used them to grow the great nation, the Israelites, later the Jewish people. 
He kept his promise to bless all people through Abraham's offspring. He sent Jesus, the Savior. He has kept his promise to forgive all your sins through Jesus' blood. He has promised you now eternal life. If he has done all these things, has always kept his promise, how will he also not come through for you to keep his promise again, to bless you, and to bring you to heaven? Amen.